Welcome to the show. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about health. And we're going to talk about health in a way that maybe you've been curious about. The Yamhill Community Care Org Organization. What is that? Who does it serve and how does it work? Um, that model that you hear is so great in Yamhill County. Well, I have with me the man that is responsible largely for that success and can tell us a lot about it, Dr. Seamus McCarthy of the Yamhill Community Care Organization. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Thank you, Ken. So, a lot of people hear about this, and we hear we're doing a good job here in Yamhill, but maybe you can just give us kind of an umbrella um, description of what is this community care organization, what does it do? Sure. Yeah, so back in 2012, you know, when the Affordable Care Act was, you know, coming into play, um, the, um, the Oregon's answer to the Affordable Care Act was community care organizations. We call them CCOs. Uh, and the idea is that the CCOs get a global budget to manage physical health, uh, mental health, behavioral health, dental health, non-emergent medical transportation services, um, and we manage those at the local community level. Uh, and the idea is to improve the care of the community, uh, to improve patient experience and patient health outcomes, and to reduce overall health care costs. Now, what community do you serve? We serve Yamhill County and uh, some contiguous zip codes with our surrounding counties. We have about 25,000 members. And to become a member, what are the, um, what are the uh, criteria? Yeah, so uh, it, it's um, a percent of the poverty level. Uh, and so there is an application that is filled out uh, and sent to the state. The state determines whether someone qualifies uh, for, uh, for OHP, Oregon Health Plan, um, or not. And then they assign the individual to a community care organization based on their geographic location. So in this location, 25,000 people have filled out this application and become members. That's correct. And those are the people that you are responsible, your organization is responsible for their health care. Yes. That's a big job. Yes. And the state has funded you to a certain level. Can you talk about how that happens? Yeah, sure. So um, the funding comes from the Oregon Health Authority. The Oregon Health Authority is the Medicaid authority uh, in um, Oregon. And so they are charged with um, delivering Medicaid to those who qualify in the state of Oregon. And so we have a five-year contract uh, with the uh, Oregon Health Authority uh, as a contractor to provide um, the required benefits to our members. The state um, sets our rates, uh, so they determine how much uh, revenue we receive in order to uh, provide the benefits. And then they also provide us with a required minimum benefit uh, that we must uh, provide. And so <clears throat> you then have this amount of money and you have this amount of people and you've got to make it work. Yes. And you have a particular way of trying to do that. We talk about that, how it's maybe different than your typical insurance company. Yeah, sure. So, well, first of all, you know, we're not driven by profits. We're really driven by getting as much of the revenue back into the community as possible, whether it's through benefits um, or through reinvesting um, uh, into the community, for instance, like in prevention and upstream kinds of interventions to, um, to uh, impact long-term population health. Uh, but what's unique about Yamhill CCO, and we really are um, uh, um, the, the most similar, or one of the most similar CCOs to the original uh, concept of CCOs, mm. which, is be, which is that they're formed at the community level and they're owned by the community and run by the community. Um, our board consists of providers of all types, um, medical, dental health, behavioral health, um, mental health providers, uh, certain nonprofits in the community. And these providers, these are all the providers that receive the dollars that we get from the state, right, to mm -hmm. provide these services to our members. And it's the providers together around the table who are making decisions about how this money is budgeted and how it is spent. And that is part of the unique makeup of CCOs and part of what makes Yamhill CCO work well. It's a very really local decision on how that money is used. Yes, absolutely. And, and it, there's not a, a profit motive by the organization. There isn't. Um, we do um, look to uh, have some sort of a margin annually so that we can um, build a nest egg for bad years, right? I mean, we okay. are at risk for uh, oh. the population. Uh -huh. uh, and that means that if we spend too many dollars, uh, then we lose dollars. Or if the population is not is getting sicker, you aren't doing the job and you won't have enough to do it. So your interest is in making sure they're healthy, having outcomes, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. So talk about how you address 
broader outcomes other than just getting someone well from an illness, what are those ways that you try to affect the larger outcomes? Well, one of the things we could talk about is the metrics that the state asks us to meet. There are a set of 17 metrics, and they're hypertension metrics, diabetes, poor control metrics, getting uh, adolescents, their adolescent well-child visits, um, those types of things. If you do this, for instance, adolescent well-child visits, and they, and they get their immunizations, um, they get the, um, the screenings that they should be getting, you can actually um, have somebody becoming healthier earlier in life so that you actually avoid health uh, outcomes or bad health outcomes in the future. So you're looking upstream to invest them that, some of that money so that people won't come back to you sick later. That's exactly right. Get people healthier earlier so they don't get sick later in life. Yes. Can you tell us about some of those programs? Yeah, so um, we are also the early learning hub uh, in Yamhill County. We're the only coordinated care organization in the state that is also the early learning hub. Uh, now, that might sound interesting or, or weird or odd to have education at the table with health care, but the reality is, is, is that if we really want to create a long-term population health strategy that improves the long-term health of our community, then we need to invest early in life, early in the first thousand days. There's a lot of evidence out there that says if you invest in evidence-based programs and through early learning programs, um, you can actually get kids um, ready to read um, uh, at the third grade lo level at a higher uh, percentage. Mm -hmm. More kids will graduate from um, high school. Um, more kids will get good jobs and contribute back to the so to society. Let they, there's less um, drinking, um, less um, experimentation with uh, drugs, and um, actually can avoid certain health um, outcomes like uh, uh, diabetes or hypertension as an adult. Uh, so these are very important programs. One program that we've invested in in the last um, few years uh, is called the Good Behavior Game. This is a social-emotional yeah. um, behavioral modification program that is implemented in kindergarten through sixth grade. And I'm happy to say that the CCO has funded this model and trained teachers in, all, in six of the seven school districts in Yamhill County. And so this wow. Good Behavior Game is an intervention that the teachers use as part of their teaching style throughout the day to influence the behavior of the children to get incidences of um, unwanted behavior to be reduced, increase teaching time and learning time for the children. You see discipline rates go down. You see, you know, again, better through grade reading uh, levels uh, uh, w with children who've gone through or experienced the good behavior game. So we continue uh, to spread this throughout the county uh, and continue to invest in this. That's only one program that we're investing in uh, and, uh, and we're looking to do more. Uh, one of the things we've done is we've created a community wellness fund. Uh, and the Wellness Fund is really meant to be a sustainable and perpetual fund year over year that will continue to make investments early in life and in prevention uh, initiatives and programs. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's really exciting for us to think about this happening because um, uh, it, it's going to take millions of dollars to invest in the kinds of social determinants that we need to invest in in order to see the long-term outcomes that we need. And we can't do that on Medicaid dollars alone. Community Wellness Fund. Yes. How is it being fed? Yeah. How is it being, uh, the, that, that money being built up? Community partners are uh, contributing to this fund. So the CCO contributes, um, um, almost uh, all of our um, contracted um, entities. Um, providers of the hospital, providers, the doctors, hospitals, the, the TPAs, uh, 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 the county, Health and Human Services. TPA, are what's the TPA? I'm sorry, third party administrator. Oh, I didn't have yeah, no idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, folks that do certain administrative services for us. Okay. Uh, and uh, they're all encouraged to contribute to this fund. Uh, and actually, just in this first year, we've raised $1.7 million for this fund. And we have strategies that we're developing um, to continue raising funds, not only from local partners in the community, but from outside of our community. Uh, philanthropic organizations or large banking institutions that need to reinvest into, into communities, um, there are a lot of folks that are interested in investing in social determinants. And if as a community we can show these folks that we know how to invest in social determinants and get the health outcomes that we want, um, we, we can encourage more investment in our community from outside of our community. That's exciting. It is. Okay, so now this money's coming in and, and you have great ways to show people this is a good place to invest it. How is it going out? What, what, 
where where are you looking to place that? You really are obviously are doing this very carefully. We are yes, of course. Um, it's very community oriented, um, and and we do a lot of community organizing around uh, what we want to invest in, so that the community really can take ownership. So, for instance, with the Good Behavior Game, mm -hmm. um, there was an overall plan that was suggested um, uh, by consultation with a social scientist um, from Oregon State or, or the University of Oregon uh, at the Oregon Research, Research Institute. Um, and we recommended a set of investments, uh, and we discussed it with the board of directors for Yamu Community Care. We went to our clinical advisory panel and got their input. We went to the Early Learning Council, which directs our Early Learning Hub and the programs and how we make those investments, uh, and got their input and came to a community consensus that the good behavior game would be something that um, we would invest in. So the way I see the Wellness Fund moving forward um, is that we would have a general uh, vision and a plan for how we wanted to invest in our community, probably have some certain programs to invest in that are building on things that we're already doing, mm -hmm. um, but then issue requests for proposals mm -hmm. in communities mm -hmm. that would do, um, that would do uh, uh, things that would contribute to the overall plan, yes. but the ideas would come from the local community and what was right for that individual community to invest in. And that hasn't ha started yet. You haven't put out requests for proposals yet. That's correct. Uh, and we, we may not get to that this year. We're developing policies and pre procedures around how this will work uh, and, uh, and how the decisions will be made. Uh, this year, we're hoping to at least have a three to five year plan of where we would like to take our community when it comes to social determinant investment. That is <laughs> exciting on the other side. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. And what was the name of that program again? It's the Community Wellness Fund. Community Wellness Fund. Yeah. All right, that's something to keep our eyes on. Yes. That's going to make a difference around here. It will absolutely make a difference, yes. When you talked about the first thousand days mm -hmm. of a child's life, it reminded me of um, what I hear from the um, relief nursery here, the fam a family place, yes. and how they are addressing this, these same upstream problems. Um, that they abbreviate as ACEs. I think more and more people are hearing about that. Talk, talk to yes. us about ACEs. What are those? Yeah, so uh, ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. And this was a study that was done about 20, 25 years ago by Kaiser. Uh, and it was a study done on the general population of, of folks that they insured. Uh, and they asked several questions about things that happened to them in life as they were growing up. Mm -hmm. For instance, did you grow up with someone who struggled with alcohol abuse or drug abuse? Um, did you grow up in a, in a home that had domestic violence, mm -hmm. right? Did you have a parent um, that was abusive? Were mm -hmm. you sexually um, um, abused as a child? Um, did you have a parent or a close family member that um, uh, completed suicide? Oh. Uh, so they asked these questions and then they, and then they scored people based mm -hmm. on their responses and, and the number of ACEs that they said they were exposed to. Yeah. And there was a direct correlation. Now remember, this was, this was done over a 20 year period, 20, 25 year period where they studied this population. And um, there was a direct correlation, the higher your ACE score, so, so the higher number of adverse childhood experiences that you had, the, um, the more adverse health outcomes you had as an adult. So more incidents, again, of hypertension, of diabetes, of alcohol abuse, um, of early pregnancy. Uh, and so the fewer the ACEs, the fewer amount of those issues a person would have in their lives. So investing in social determinants early in life can help prevent the adverse child ex experiences and really put a child on a totally different trajectory. So the early learning hub, is that of one of the main um, um, aspects of your program that addresses reducing ACEs? Uh, that's one of the things that one. the Early Learning Hub does, yes. And Early Learning Hubs um, have been a, around for a while uh, in the state. They were named differently before, um, but um, basically they're regional um, organizations that receive dollars from the Oregon Department of Education mm -hmm. and, um, and some guidelines with um, what early learning programs uh, to invest in in mm -hmm. the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and we are the only coordinated care organization in the state that is also, uh, as I was saying, the early learning hub. Uh, and so, yeah, we do focus on early, the first thousand days of life is, mm -hmm. is very important. All your brain synapses are getting 
formed during that first thousand years of life, uh, thousand, thousand days of life. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the time a child is three, most of the brain development has happened. So if you have a lot of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences that are happening to a child between one and three, and those brain synapses aren't forming as they should, then this leads to the, to the adverse outcomes uh, that I was talking about earlier. So how does the early learning hub get out into the community and, and make these differences? So what, what are their programs? How do they how do they do that? Yeah, so we have um, educators at the table, um, lots of um, nonprofits at the table who um, provide services, um, like the Relief Nursery is at the table on our Early Learning Hub uh, mm -hmm. that you mentioned, um, Head Start. Um, um, all of our um, seven school districts are represented uh, on the Early Learning Council. Uh, and they choose what programs to invest in um, in this community. And what are a couple of those programs? Are there helps for parents? Are there parenting classes? Or what, what kind of interventions, is that the right word, that you, yeah. can you make to, to help? Yeah, so I mean, like, um, we've made uh, investments in the um, relief nursery. Uh -huh. um, um, we've uh, given a couple of grants to the, to the relief nursery to develop a new relief nursery in the West Valley. Which big is, deal. Yeah, we're going to share it. That's where that money deal. came from. I heard that was happening. Well, some. I mean, we, they just got a very generous donation of $150,000. Um, from? From, you know, I can't remember the organization that they got it from, but. We'll remember before it's over. We will. Uh, but, uh, but yes, we have contributed to the development of that. Um, uh, was it Meyer? Was, was it Meyer Memorial Trust or something like that? It, no. it, it, I don't think it was Meyer. Um, Commun Oregon Community Foundation. Right here, local. Yeah. Yeah, it was a local award. They're very good. You yeah, got it. Thank go. you. Uh, and, uh, and so that's a program that we invest in. Absolutely, parent education. Uh, is something that we invest in. Several organizations, including Lutheran Community Services and Head Start, do um, parent education, teaching parents how to really, again, we're getting in with parents in that first thousand days of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So these investments are going to take years to pay off. You're, you're having to put maybe, maybe in the future there'll be such good outcomes that there won't be such a burden at, at people's in later in life. Well, that certainly is the goal, right? Um, it's challenging, though, because we have, you know, what I would call and what many people call a sick care system. We take care of people when they get sick, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could really care for people earlier in life so that they didn't get sick later in life? And those investments are typically a lot less expensive than paying for somebody who, you know, has diabetes and, and is really struggling with that disease. It can get very expensive to treat a diabetic, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, c preventing that from happening by investing early in life um, it can have huge uh, return on investment and dividends. The, the problem is how do, you, how do you prove what was pre prevented? Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. prove that you actually prevented something from happening? And how do you put a dollar amount on that, right? And then the other thing is, you know, well, it takes a while for these outcomes to be realized. So, you know, it's the long term. It's five to ten years. Well, that's why this not having a profit model in this situation, that the state has said, we're going to invest here because we believe this is, mm -hmm. this is a good model. Mm -hmm. And it it's kind of takes that. And we don't have shareholders saying, when's it going to pay off? Mm -hmm. um, they have taxpayers saying, when's it going to pay off? Yes. So they, they do, and they do actually... Um, reward or incentivize your outcomes. Isn't that correct? How does that happen? Yes, absolutely. So yes, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization owned by the Yamhill community and run by the Yamhill community. Uh, and um, uh, remind me of your question. Again. Um, the incentivization, incentivization of, yes, the of, out, of good outcomes. Yes, correctly. There, there are 17 um, health metrics that we are um, graded on, if you will, by Oregon Health Authority. Mm -hmm. And they want us to meet you know, as many of these 17 as possible. So they're diabetes poor control. In other words, uh, how are you keeping someone's diabetes under control? Percentages Hypertension. of, of um, immunization of children. Yes, adolescent well child visits. You know, um, what, uh, keeping people out of the ED. You know, there are some metrics around um, uh, uh, persistent mental illness, people with persistent mental illness and um, incidences of them in the ED uh, f f for, uh, um, for health uh, uh, maybe conditions. So, maybe screening of things? Do you yes, uh, absolutely. What we do, do child, for? child screenings. Okay. You know, there's a adolescent well child screening, which is not just, um, you know, um, going and um, 
treating something that may be wrong with the child. It's actually mm -hmm. doing screenings, whether it's for physical health issues or dental health issues or behavioral health issues, so that you're identifying all these issues um, before they get to a critical mass. Well, I think people watching today are thinking, this is a great model. Uh, but I don't see it being applied to outside this population that we've identified. It would seem to be a good idea to expand that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it would be, you know, I mean, coordinated care is a great concept and it can work. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I think it's important, one, is that, is that it's really driven by the local community. Healthcare is done differently in each community. Mm -hmm. And, and so, the, so the local community should really be directing um, what their healthcare looks like and what the investments look like, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and now we represent only 25% of our population, right? Mm -hmm. We insured about 25,000 members. Um, so 75% of our population um, have health insurance by commercial organizations or they buy it from the exchange, right? Yes. So we need partnerships with our commercial um, payers uh, that do similar investments that we do, right? We can't make all the investments that are needed in our in our county on mm -hmm. Medicaid dollars mm -hmm. alone. Again, we only work with 25,000 members, right? 25% of the population. So really, as a community, part of what we need to do and part of what the Community Prevention and Wellness Fund uh, will do mm -hmm. is to hopefully build partners with our commercial um, uh, uh, partners, really, mm -hmm. uh, in the community to be making similar investments um, that, that the CCO is making. All right, so that is a way that things can be more on this outcome-based model rather than a profit-based model. <laughs> Sure. Okay. You know, I, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, as a community care organization and nonprofit, every dollar we earn goes back into the community. Every dollar. Yeah. Let's just step back for a minute, Seamus, and say, how did you come to this? You are the president and CEO of this incredible organization we have. Um, you probably didn't go to college thinking, I'm going to be the president of a community care organization yeah. because they didn't exist <laughs> at that right. time. Yeah. What was your path? Where did you start? Are you from? Where are you from? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Montana. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, eventually uh, went to school out of state and found my way to Arizona and I spent uh, 20 plus years uh, in real estate uh, mm -hmm. in Arizona. And there came a point in my life where I didn't want to do that anymore. And as a younger man, I thought about doing uh, psychology or, or um, social work. And so I said, you know, I'm gonna, I want to get into the helping profession. Uh, and so I made a path for myself um, at 40 uh, to, um, to, to kind of change what I was doing. Uh, and, uh, and I got my master's degree, my PhD in psychology, and eventually found my way uh, into the primary care business. I worked with Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center here in, uh, in Yamhill County. Uh, and I was one of the founding community members who worked on forming Yamhill Community Care Organization in the first uh, round of contracts with CCOs. So those founding members, those were volunteers. You were volunteering to pull this thing together? Absolutely, yes, yes. As are all of our board members are volunteers, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, uh, and so I've really been working with the, with the CCO from the very beginning. Uh, I was brought on uh, as the director of operations for the CCO in 2014 when the decision was made by the board to do more administrative services, mostly around quality, um, locally. Uh, and then since then, we have built um, our administrative organization here in town. Uh, so that's what we've been doing. Well, congratulations. And like I said, um, this is, organization is known for being effective. And sadly, in comparison with uh, uh, some other CEOs around the state that aren't doing as well. And maybe I heard what you say is that one of the reasons of our success is you've, you've stayed uh, true to the original model. Mm -hmm. And that's the model we've been talking about. Right. And I guess somehow there are ways to wander astray. Um, and some of these are, are run by a uh, for-profit operation, some other Correct. community care organizations. And, and you said that's not an impossible model to be successful, a for-profit. No. But yeah. some for-profits are run better than others. The, some are, right. You know, and, and there are for-profits that have great missions, visions of values, right? Mm -hmm. And, and for-profits that make great investments into the community. And we need to encourage more for-profits to have that outlook, right, um, in community reinvestment and long-term community health. But you know, the CCO model, there, there are some um, parts of the state that struggle more than others with the model. But overall, it's been a very successful model. We've improved health outcomes, definitely we have. Mm -hmm. Yamhill CCO has tripled access to, uh, to services for Medicaid members. I mean, there was a time when providers didn't want to treat Medicaid, right? I see. 
uh, it, it didn't pay enough and, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and we've worked with the local communities to really expand um, that access. And it's, so it's by estimated. having those providers at the table saying, yes. how can we do this? They yep. say, well, if you did this, then we could do it. That's correct. Okay. Yep. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, no. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, part of how we did that was by by building some value-based payment contracts, some alternative payment methodologies mm -hmm. around quality outcomes that would reimburse the clinics at higher rates or give them a per member per month add-on for having a certain clinical model that was patient-centered. And so we've really not only uh, uh, increased access, but we've helped change how providers uh, care for members in the community by building a, a team clinical model that's patient-centered. That is huge. I mean, what you just described of a Medicare kind of process that wasn't working, mm. you came in and changed how it worked, and, and now you've, like you say, you've tripled access. Yeah. That we, we, we definitely have a better system for managing Medicaid uh, in our county than we did before. Yeah. Uh, and, um, folks who qualify for Oregon Health Plan, uh, in my estimation and review, are getting um, better care from our providers than what they used to get. Not mm -hmm. that the care was bad before, mm -hmm. but you know, there's always improvement to be made. Uh, and we are achieving better health outcomes. And I did want to say you know, that, that the CCO model uh, across the state, there's an estimated, OHSU did a study, that, um, that, that between the federal and state governments, um, we've, over the last six years as CCOs, we've saved uh, more than $20 billion for the feds in the state. So let's just let that hang in the air for a yes. moment. <laughs> wow. Yes. And an important part of the CCO model, I mean, first it's all about care, right? It's delivering the right care at the right time to the right folks mm -hmm. and making sure people are experiencing care well, right? Um, but part of it is you, we know that, you know, in, that in many years, um, health care trend has been in the double digits. That's not sustainable yeah. for our country. No. We can't provide good health insurance for everybody if it's growing at 12 and 13 and 15 percent annually. Mm -hmm. You know, so we really have a target here as a CCO to have a trend of the below 3.4 percent. Uh, and it's a, um, um, it's, a, it's a challenging goal. But I can tell you that Yamhill CCO is committed to that goal. Uh, and, uh, and we have strategies that we're working with our partners to help us attain that goal. It's important. I mean, you know, we need to be able to provide great health care to every Oregonian. Uh, we have to do it affordably. Well, I just see you and your organization managing tax dollars in a, an incredible way. Mm -hmm. And I just think that people watching are thinking, wow, the, the, the government's working. <laughs> Maybe you don't consider yourself government, but the plan that was instituted by the state has really is really paying off from those things that you quoted. I, I would agree with that, but I also need to say mm -hmm. that it's due to this local community. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the state created the policy. Okay. The straight the the state has the revenue and provided the revenue, mm -hmm. right? Which you need those two things in order to really have any sort of policy that's going to be impactful. You got to be able to fund it. Mm -hmm. uh, so they fund it. They create the policy, but it's the local community and the providers who've the made it work. Okay. They're the ones who've made it work. Um, Caroline, you had the logo up a minute ago. Let's just now you have a new uh, you have a new brand. We do. Yes, we uh, it, you know we are applying for a second contract, a second five year contract with Oregon Health Authority. Uh, we're in the middle of writing that application now, and in the midst of that, we decided we want to do a brand refresh to really focus more on community care uh, and uh, and early learning, and that's what we've done. Well, you just opened a big uh, subject there of your applying for you have an application to continue doing what you're doing yes. with the state. So I guess they kind of make sure you uh, are on your toes every five years, right? Well, absolutely. And not only just every five years, but we get audited annually yeah. uh, for um, deliverables that we promised that we're going to deliver uh, to the state. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, um, procurement process is a legal process. It's required by the state mm -hmm. uh, every so often that you go out for bid, right? Um, that's how part of how um, you manage the tax dollars well. Make sure that you're contracting with folks who are giving you the best bang for the buck, right? And so that's what we're doing. We're applying for another five-year contract. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, and I, it's very exciting, uh, and I'm very confident that we'll, we'll be doing this for at least another five years. Well, Seamus, we're out of time. I, I'll have you back in a few years, and we'll continue the story. Thank you Excellent. so much for being here today. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it.